Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to our webinar, Why Cloud Management Makes Sense. This is the first webinar in a four-part series called Getting Started in the Cloud, so thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, though, we have a few questions that will help us to understand your experience with cloud and cloud management. This information will help us tailor our presentation today to be as relevant as possible, so thanks in advance for your response. Let's launch those polls now. Okay, the first question's up. Are you using the cloud today? The cloud, as we define it, is infrastructure as a service. So using Amazon EC2 or Rackspace, or maybe you're on a private cloud. So please select one, the one that is most relevant for you. The first option here, yes, you're using the cloud and you have several serious projects. You're using the cloud and you have at least one project that's becoming more significant. Maybe you're beginning to explore, or maybe no, you're simply not on the cloud quite yet. I'm going to let this run for a few more seconds. Publishing the results now. And okay, cool. It uh, looks like the majority of you are beginning to explore, but there's actually a pretty broad distribution of this audience. So thank you for responding. We've got two more questions for you. Second question is... If you are using cloud, are you using cloud management? So this is a pretty simple question. Select one that is the most relevant for you. So yes, you're using cloud management from the cloud provider. So maybe you're using um, Amazon's EC2 console or something else from a different cloud provider. Um, yes, uh, you're using RightScale. That would be very cool. Uh, yes, you're uh, using cloud management from another third party. No, you're not, but you're exploring and interested, or no. Very easy. A few more seconds. Okay, cool. We're going to close the polls down, show the results, and I have to say I'm not surprised that most of you are not, but you're exploring. That's great because that's actually what today's webinar is totally about. So you'll, you'll do a lot of exploring, a lot of learning today. And thanks to that little green slice that says yes, right scale. We love you guys. Last question. Simple question, what is your role? So this helps us understand if you're maybe a technical developer and a technical user <clears throat> or more of a, a business user for your team. So the choices that we have here, app developer, sysadmin, architect, or team lead business manager. And the idea with that last role is that you maybe wouldn't actually be the person coding or the actual person managing the servers. A couple more seconds. Closing the polls and sharing the results. And again, a nice distribution looks about 50-50 technical business. So cool. Good to meet you guys. And my name's Sarah, in case you were wondering. Um, and with that, actually, we will go ahead and get started with the webinar. And I will introduce you to my team here. I guess they're not my team. It's us. We're a team. Um, on my right, I have Michael Crandell, CEO, RightScale. Uh, you can see his Twitter handle right there. Go ahead and follow him. And then I, on my left, I have Yuri Budnik, director of our ISV partner program. And his twiddle ha tw twiddle <laughs> Twitter handle is there as well. Um, I also have in the room with me Chad Carty. He's an account manager at RightScale, and he's here to answer your questions live as they come in. Um, so go ahead, use the GoToWebinar question panel to answer your questions at any time. Chad will answer those quickly for you, and some will actually select to answer live over the air by Michael and Yuri. So with that, Michael, take it away. Thank you, Sarah, and greetings, everybody. Uh, great to have you with us today. Today we're going to be covering on this webinar uh, really why does cloud management make sense. And we'll start with a few comments about <clears throat> cloud computing context in general. And then we want to dive into detail about what we believe are the four major areas of benefit and payoff to using a cloud management solution. We'll be covering automation, uh, the provision of cloud-ready solutions, control of your cloud resources, and portability. Uh, we'll have a little bit of wrap-up and then allow plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, so, and, and that, by the way, continues during the entire webinar. Uh, so you can feel free, as, as we said, to ask questions over the chat channel. 
So why don't we go ahead and, and dive directly in, and, and uh, Yuri, why don't you give us a little bit of context on cloud computing in general? Thank you, Michael, and I think, yeah, this is a, a good place to start. So all of us on this webinar, obviously, we know about cloud computing, but it not might be as clear for all of us that the, really the major shift, the title shift, as we're calling it here, that's taking place right now. We're looking at a diagram that originated from Cisco showing you there across the bottom the number of servers that are deployed in data centers out there. And you can see a major inflection point there taking place in the center as the shift is happening from private data centers to cloud computing environments. And it's really that massive growth that we're seeing firsthand on the, on the Ryscale side taking place right now. In fact, if you go to our homepage, ryscale.com, we keep a counter of the service launched by our customers using our software, and we're approaching 3 million servers right now, and we see that rate accelerating continuously. So we're really in the middle of a major transformation in the way that people consume IT services. In fact, uh, there's a book called The Big Switch, where it gets compa compared, I think, very effectively to the shift in business not quite a century ago when companies went from having to run their own electrical generators to being able to just buy electricity from a grid and pay only for what they use and not have to maintain the physical plant and all that cost. Uh, in fact, uh, it's being called the third revolution. If you think about PCs being the first revolution, the internet and the global spread and how it's really changed all our lives and how we conduct business uh, being the second one, cloud computing as the third revolution fits in that scale of the transformative effect. It is really creating a new IT stack in terms of how companies can deploy their environments. And it's useful when we think about cloud to, to really refer to what are we talking about exactly. And a useful metaphor is to think about a complexity that does not need to be managed. Because it can mean different things. But at the, at the most basic, it means that you're consuming technological resources when you don't have to concern yourself with the operations thereof. And what you're seeing on the right side of the screen, it's a diagram that telcos used to employ, but actually they still do when they're selling a network to a company that wants to connect their different offices. And the idea of painting a cloud in the middle was that the telephone company would give you point-to-point -point connections between, say, your New York, LA, Chicago, and San Francisco office, but you didn't need to concern yourself with all the details of how that circuit got connected to and through. It just worked for you. And the point of demarcation, the edge of the cloud, was where you took over, in this case, connecting to a router. What we're seeing now with cloud computing is that point of demarcation moving out to actually include servers where you don't need to manage the equipment the servers run on. You just get an operating system that you get to install and configure and manage from there. So it's really very much an application-centric deployment and operations model. And we, we, we really look at what's driving this change. And there's the perennial business need to cut cost. And, and of course, that's something that every company out there is looking at. But Probably more importantly is this idea of agility. Because by being able to deploy uh, solutions quicker, you gain a lot of flexibility that in turn goes right to your bottom line. We hear from customers that are able to turn up environments weeks and months faster and realize additional revenue from that. I used to work in a data center and we used to look at deploying companies that took space there in say 90 days. We we're pretty happy if they deploy in 60 days. Now we talk about minutes for, for the time it takes to stand up a server in the cloud. So we have literally gone from months to minutes, and we see that all the time, but we become rather impatient, in fact, when something takes uh, more than single-digit minutes to, to launch in the cloud. And, 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 and the other huge advantage is the ability to leverage the, the scale that you can get out of the cloud. Instead of having to spend a lot of time forecasting how much equipment to buy and have in place, you can leverage the ability of having resources at your fingertips and because of that, you can create more reliable environments where you can have multiple machines in case something fails, your environments don't go out. And this makes it possible to create a best practices approach where you can use the cloud in the most efficient way that we are seeing evolving as we, uh, as we create the best practices for how to deploy those systems. Now, people usually, uh, people can mean different things when they're talking about cloud. And there's the different approaches of software as a service, and platform as a service, and infrastructure service. And it really has to do where that layer of abstraction lays. When you're looking at software as a service, you're accessing an application through your web browser. 
say, Salesforce. The layer of abstraction is anything below that web browser. You don't need to concern yourself with how it runs. You can be looking at platform as a service, say the Google App Engine, where you can you have a lot more control because you can upload your code in, say, Python, for example, your business logic, and you don't know anything about the servers or how they run. It's just your business rules about how you want your application to run, so that's that abstraction layer. Or you can look at infrastructure as a service, which is servers and IP networks the way they work today, except you're not managing the actual equipment, but you have complete access to the operating system and the configuration thereof. And you get the scalability of those because of the uniformity. If I was a provider, for example, of software as a service, I just need to make sure my application can talk to those web browsers out there, and that's a uniform point of entry to me, HTML and HTTP, and I don't have to manage the rest of it. And on the area that we work on, which is infrastructure as a service, we have seen that really true clouds are API driven, meaning that they can be controlled not just by somebody clicking on something on a user interface, but by automated systems. And we are seeing a massive explosion since we concentrate on the infrastructure as a service area in, in the business that Brightscale is in. We're showing you here just a small sample of the different infrastructure as a service companies that are out there offering services today. And we're talking about the very beginning of the environment. And we, and we think this is just going to increase from here. Right. We already know <coughs> well <coughs> into the hundreds of, of uh, service providers offering cloud. It will go into the thousands, no question. So that's the direction we're headed. Sounds like a pretty pretty picture of the world, Yuri. It sounds very easy. So why aren't we all just flocking to cloud? Why don't we just get on there now? What's the problem? Well, the problem is that it's a little bit easier uh, sounding than it is in actuality. And that it's very, very critical that you pay attention to the design of how your uh, applications in the cloud are configured all the way through the stack. Uh, one of the things we've learned uh, from many, many experiences working with customers adopting or migrating to the cloud is that using the cloud is not the same as designing for the cloud. Uh, so there's this phenomenon that I call accidental tourist in the cloud. That's somebody who signs up, launches some servers, sits back, and says, great, I'm golden, I got it taken care of, it's running. The problem is that you really need to anticipate uh, various kinds of operational modes that may pop up, including failure modes of the underlying cloud. Um, we've heard that philosophy preached since day one, plan for failure, design for failure, etc. So you really need to think about what is good cloud design, uh, not just around failure modes, but around security. Um, as well as reliability, and then around you know business issues like what if I need to move to a different provider or add another provider? Or I want to move my infrastructure in-house as well as public or vice versa. These are all key issues, key challenges to think about. And one area to really think about is uh, again this what what I call the DIY trap, the do-it-yourself trap. So. There's our little handyman. He's got um, a bunch of tools there, and he's ready to go. Most clouds are really a set of APIs and or a simple user interface to launch servers. So the starting point is ask yourself, is that really what you need? Do you really want to get down and dirty and be dealing with the very lowest level of granularity in building your applications? Or do you want to focus on a different level of core competency? That's a key question. Um, do, you, do you really need something more than these individual building blocks to put together a system? Isn't it an advantage to be able to focus higher on, uh, on what your business goals are? And ultimately, how do you want to spend your time? So cloud management solutions offer things like managing multiple users with different levels of access, config management, application lifecycle, there are ways uh, to track usage and costs across applications and business units, uh, as well as a whole host of other functionality ranging from monitoring, alarms, auto-scaling, and we'll go into the details that you really don't get if you just take the do-it-yourself approach. Uh, not to mention the issues around uh, freedom of choice of which resource pools you use. 
And then there's the question, what do you do about people in your organization who, with all good intention, may be just going out uh, on their own, opening cloud accounts, deploying environments, and running resources on behalf of your business that you have no visibility into? Uh, there's a really kind of yellow or red flag issue uh, implicit there. So all of this leads up to the subject of the webinar today. What are the key reasons for cloud management? How does it work? What are the benefits? So we're going to talk now about four areas. Automation, the provision of cloud-ready solutions, how you can deliver really great levels of control over what you're doing and what areas you can control, and then ultimately freedom of choice and portability. So again, what we're talking about here is leveraging a management platform to be able to focus above the complexity and the tedious work of dealing with the low-level APIs and building blocks and focus more on the core competency of your business while delivering agility in your IT operation, ultimately your business, and the ability to achieve a return on investment almost immediately. So let's launch into the reason number one of automation. I'd like to share a, a graphic that was actually uh, produced about five years ago. It was a projection uh, around IT infrastructure growth of the component costs that were involved. And you can see in the color-coded graph uh, how much was being projected to be spent on new servers, meaning hardware, how much was projected on power and cooling costs, and how much on server management and administration. Of course, this is, uh, this is all focused around uh, internal data center construction, so deploying your own data center uh, facilities and hardware. And it was coming out of, at the time, virtualization, uh, a virtualization study. But what you see here, and it's largely played out to be true, is that uh, the majority of the growth and the vast bulk of the increase in spending is around management and administration costs. That the reality is that even when hardware servers are virtualized, there's still quite a lot of effort and investment required, both around headcount, um, software, etc., in order to be able to manage it all effectively. And those of you who manage IT deployments know this to be true. It's, it's the biggest cost center. So that's also the ripest area for cost savings. Um, here was another graph done. I got this from, um, uh, as a reference from James Hamilton, who's now the, uh, one of the master data center designers at Amazon, around Amazon Web Services. And he did this, or captured it from a colleague five years ago. This was around, again, the component costs uh, focused on operational efficiency in data centers. And you can see in the red highlighted area that 51% of the costs are around deployment management or incident, uh, deployment-related incident management. So again, uh, management costs, ripe area for savings. So what this boils down to at the end of the day, both of these charts we look at in terms of server to system administrator ratio. So how many servers can the average system administrator manage? Of course, this does vary pretty widely based on how many different apps they're managing and the types of apps, et cetera, what kinds of workloads are running. But you know, some guidelines are that a pretty inefficient operation is one admin, one person to 20 servers uh, back in the day, an above average ratio was one person managing 150. Enterprises typically fall kind of in the 70 to 140 range. Uh, but what we're seeing in best practices today using cloud is ratios of thousands per sysadmin being managed through automation. So again, this is a key area that's driving the savings in cost as well as operational excellence. Um, and it's really uh, one of the keys to, uh, to the benefit of cloud management. Let's take a look at a case study here. So yeah, Michael, let's talk about the results that a company can get by taking advantage of this automation. But actually, before I start, I want to remind everybody, we have a feature where you can ask questions during the webinar, and we'd love to 
get some feedback from you about the things you might want to know more about. We're going to have a Q&A period at the end of the webinar itself, but go ahead and start asking questions because we're looking at those as they come in. Please, uh, please take advantage of that if, uh, if you may. So going back to the automation subject, uh, I, I took this data from a presentation that a VP of uh, Zynga gave at Interop a few months back in uh, May of 2011. And if you look at the figures, they're really astounding in every metric. Uh, by the way, for anybody wondering whether the cloud can tackle enterprise scale kind of deployments, uh, I, I think uh, that matter has been put to rest in a while ago when you look at the, the sheer size of uh, the infrastructure that Zynga is running to maintain their Facebook games. Uh, we're talking about uh, approaching 300 million people playing those games every month. So single games that have tens of millions of people playing them every single day. And let's look at uh, Farmville, for example. Uh, Zynga has been very, very clever about taking maximum advantage of the automation they can get from cloud management. So it's not just this ability to pay for the service by the hour. It's really completely automating all the processes that take place operationally when you're deploying a game, the number of servers you need running throughout the day or the night when different numbers of people are playing, and all the other uh, automation things that you can do above and beyond just auto-provisioning servers. And, and if, if you look at the numbers, they had for Farmville 25 million daily active users within the first five months. That's more than one million new users a week. And we're not saying somebody that logged in gave their email address and then never came back. We're, we're talking about adding another million new people that are playing, if not every day, almost every day. So massive environments. Even with an unlimited budget, logistically you could not stand up an environment and maintain an environment that I was growing at this kind of rate. So the, the high degree of automation that you can get from cloud management means that you can you can really take humans out of anything that, that computers can control themselves so that you're not always solving problems and putting out fires. You just concentrate on designing the things in a way that takes the most advantage of the cloud. And of course it's the most fun to talk about this when you're talking about the examples that are, that, that are just uh, humongous like this. But the best practices really apply to large-scale environments like we're using in this example, but also to companies that might have a dozen or two dozen servers that you also don't want to be always running at two in the morning to fix something instead of being able to have a system in place so when a server fails, it automatically gets replaced with another one that's got a backup of the configuration and the data. So that's one of the huge parts or the benefits of the automation that also translates into being able to run the environments in more flexible ways. As I was uh, giving Zynga a compliment for being very clever about how they run their environments. They, des they decided a while back to build their own private cloud. They call it ZCloud. And they actually, by using cloud management, can control all those resources in their own private data center and in the public cloud from a single pane of glass. And they can actually move configurations and the infrastructure for a specific game from one environment to the other that way. And let's talk now about cloud-ready solutions, another of the benefits of cloud management. So when Rysta started about four years ago, uh, we built all these server templates because we realized that it, it was really about being able to stand up the applications for the solutions that you wanted to deploy in the cloud. And, and later on, we started working with lots of uh, enterprise software companies to create uh, commercial software that they make available as well. And there's a whole library, we call it the multi-cloud marketplace, where you can leverage all these pre-built solutions that are there. The idea is that, yes, anybody can maybe download MySQL and install it in a machine, but that does not a best practices server make. What you want to be able to do is take advantage of the capabilities that are in the cloud. How are you going to deal with contingencies like backing up a server to virtual storage or being able to operationalize the ability to go from a master-slave configuration where one machine fails? So instead of companies having to recreate and reinvent the wheel, there's a whole host of pre-built solutions that, that people can, can use there. And it's really all around this idea that we have created of server templates. And these are machines that really, as they stand up, as they boot up in a virtual server, they configure themselves according to the role they need to take. So they're based on a, having a base operating system that's set up, but then a series of scripts will run at boot time 
that will install and configure things. So the servers, a fancy way of saying it is they contextualize themselves as they boot up. If you're going to need a web server, the scripts might be installing and configuring Apache. If you need a database, the, the scripts might be installing and configuring MySQL, for example. But that means you can tweak it and modify it and customize it each way for the specific role that you are going to need. And that means that you have companies then that are taking advantage of this approach that have lots of server templates, but they have a very small number of operating system configurations to maintain. You might have, say, a CentOS 5.4 image, and on the server template that uses that, it could become a database, a load balancer, a web server. And that's another big advantage of the automation because when you look at having to maintain environments, having just one version of the operating system to maintain dramatically simplifies it. If there's operations people out there, I'm sure some of you are maintaining hundreds of configurations. And you know what tremendous headache uh, this can be and, and frankly just a business challenge. So just a quick question, Yuri. How, how does this compare to machine images? The, the, the main difference is that machine images are, an easy way to compare them is like having a big file of everything that you install and configure on that server, kind of like a CD. I can make as many copies of it as I want, but it's going to be identical to whatever that original was. And that's useful. You can send up identical copies. We've learned, though, and, and we encountered this problem years ago, that you want something that's very close to what you originally configured, but you might want to tweak it a little bit. I stand up a new application server, but I want it to connect to a different database, not the same one that I have in production. So the idea of server templates is that they look more like a playlist you might have in iTunes or in an iPod or in an iPhone. I have a set of things it's going to do, and I can change the order they happen in. I can take out songs. I can add songs. I can clone it exactly as it is. It's from this flexibility that the power of the automation comes from. And in terms of cloud-ready solutions, it means that you can deploy things like this, like your scalable web apps. For non-technical people, this might look uh, sort of complicated at first glance. It's really what's called a three-tier architecture, except in this case it's got a caching tier. But instead of a company having to build this from scratch, you can actually, from the multi-cloud marketplace that I was showing a moment ago, you can pull those pre-built components, add them into what we call a deployment, and make some minor configuration changes, and the application server is actually aware of where and how to connect to the database. Or because of the automation, you can choose to have your database slave for redundancy and for safety in a different geographical area, so that you don't have all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, when it comes to location. So just to clarify, we're, we're talking here not just about single server templates, but clusters or groups of them that, that interoperate. Correct, because you go from managing individual machines to managing at the system level, managing groups of machines. That's another big difference of having a cloud management system on top of your environments. Uh, another, another rather popular approach is this idea of developing and testing in the cloud. For anybody that's managing a team of developers, you never have enough hardware for them to set up a whole new configuration with a new permutation of the things they need to check and test. So using cloud management, you can actually control who has access to what and how. So you can have an administrative person that has complete access to all the resources and capabilities, but maybe therefore has to deal with a little bit more complexity because they got more choices on the things they can do, and they could be managing a production environment, and they perhaps are deploying a new version of their site, and they want to run it through some QA testing, and they can make a clone of that and give a group of testing, perhaps even outsourcing to a different company, access to only that kind of testing environment so they don't have to worry about them uh, perhaps um, inadvertently changing anything else. Or you can give a team of developers a pre-approved server configuration, and they can then use a self-service portal. They don't need to call IT to set up a machine, to wait for that to happen, and IT doesn't need to worry about whether they're using the right image or the right patches with, a, with, with the audited and approved configuration that they need to run. And by cutting all those steps, it means that people can be more productive. And uh, another really useful one, we're talking a lot about web applications, this whole idea of batch processing, companies that are doing things like encoding videos or doing chemical simulations, where you have this mass compute jobs, but that are nevertheless discrete and independent, meaning you can parallelize them. So using cloud management, you can set up uh, systems where it's much simpler to set up a queuing job where you can run through massive batches of, of systems, and it changes the way you look at them. 
for companies that have this in today, we've noticed where people are fighting about jumping the queue because the resources are usually overtaxed and somebody needs to get their project done ahead of somebody else. And now they're fighting about, well, let's still let your project while I get mine done. It changes the calculus when you use cluster management and you move it in the cloud. It's really more about how long is something going to take because you have access to the resources there. And just, uh, you know, again, to clarify what that graph on top is showing between zero and 100%. Uh, also below it um, is represented, it's really discrete servers that are being launched and then terminated. So in a world where it's pay-as-you-go, there's uh, two huge benefits. One is, of course, uh, auto-scaling down, <laughs> and that's when you don't need the resource, so you don't pay for them. But then having access to resources to go ahead and scale up when you need to also in that kind of uh, intermittent or bursty yeah. Uh, manner is, is just super benefit. Because of the way that these batch processes work, just by the nature, they're very, uh, what we call spiking, meaning there's periods when you're really busy, you need to use them, and there's long periods when you're not interacting with the system, so you've got machines that are idle, that are just costing you money. In, in fact, there, there's a company, Illy, uh, Lilly rather, the pharmaceutical company, that's taking a very novel approach, and they built their own control system on top of our cloud management system, for example, and they have what they like to call the software vending machines. Kind of cool, and it's a self-service portal. So they have scientists that want to perform different experiments. Instead of mixing chemicals in a lab, they're doing uh, computations to simulate uh, organic chemistry molecules reacting with each other. And this, this particular um, screenshot was actually a mock-up. I don't think this is actually the apps they're running. You can see mostly they're open source. Yeah. Uh, examples of what they built for a demo, but this is their own UI that they built on top of the RightScale API. Correct. And, and it changes how they approach it because it's no longer about can I jump the queue and get in front of somebody else's project. Is Does my team, does my project have the budget to perform the following calculation and then I can provision and run and set up the environment myself. Excellent. All right, let's move on to reason number three, control. And by the way, just one final comment under the subject of control about server templates. We did a, 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 some research earlier this calendar year into how many different variations of server templates were running on our system. And we found out that there were 42,000 variants running, over 42,000. This, I believe, was in January 2011. Um, not meaning that those are all separate application server templates but that companies and individuals wanted to take a basic template and then modify it or customize it for their particular needs, their particular situation. And to me, that harkens back to the whole notion of control, which is in the infrastructure as a service world, one of the big benefits is the customizability and the control down to a very low level. So, Michael, that's somebody grabbing, say, a web server or another application server and then making the changes they need to apply specifically to the project they're working on, right? Exactly they right. Leverage they, they might be fairly small changes yeah. that they make. Yeah. Uh, and that's back to the analogy of the playlist. They're able to make those changes very easily um, as opposed to editing, trying to edit a whole CD in the yeah. music analogy, which nobody can do. So moving on, let's move on around control. Um, these are the areas, I want to talk through this in a little bit of detail because it's one of the important benefits of cloud management. The first is monitoring. And monitoring in our world extends well beyond the notion of monitoring hardware and software metrics uh, and putting up graphs. Of course, that's super useful. And RightScale, by the way, has monitoring graphs that, that extend from individual particular server graphs of particular metrics like CPU, CPU load on an individual server to things like stacked uh, graphs showing multiple servers or even heat maps which can show hundreds of servers at a time and allow you visually to easily identify where a particular hotspot or problem area might be. But in addition to the basic monitoring, we're capturing logs uh, persistent logs, even of servers that come and go in the cloud in a grid computing scenario or a scaling scenario, we capture and persist the logs so that you can go back afterwards uh, forensically and ask the question, what happened last Monday afternoon at 2.22 in the afternoon 
uh, with server number 37. So Michael, in, in the cloud the service come and go, so I could be presented with a situation where I come in on Monday, lots of activity happened, but because the servers have disappeared, meaning they were the commission, I no longer have any data about them. That's right, and that can be a big problem when you're trying to go back and track what happened, or you need to keep that data for uh, regulatory compliance reasons, uh, or just for operational reasons. So logs are persisted. Also audit entries. Audit entries are, are something a little different. They track all the actions that happen on a given resource from the moment it's requested till it's terminated and, and finally relinquished by the cloud. So these would include things like the launching of a server, a server becoming operational, someone logging into it, someone requesting that a script be run on it. Um, Actions like that, those are also stored and, and persisted. Then there are alerts and escalations. Uh, so many monitoring systems have alerts uh, on your phone, uh, SMS, etc., email, to let you know that some borderline condition has been hit. RightScale has a fairly sophisticated language for uh, creating policies around those alerts and a concept we call escalations which allow an alert to go to a higher level action based on certain conditions. So one example of an escalation uh, is in the use of auto-scaling. So for example, uh, you can control how auto-scaling works by setting a rule that says when the CPU load on your servers exceeds 50% for more than three minutes, then escalate to a scaling event. And you can have another rule that says, let's watch how many servers in a particular collection are, are issuing that escalation. And if there are more than, say, 50% issuing that escalation, then let's launch new servers. All of that is monitored automatically, and, uh, and the steps taken can be automatic also. We also track last access. Uh, so in addition to the audit entries of what's going on, we track user access, which leads us into the whole uh, topic of user management. So of course there's a, um, an authentication system. We have built-in single sign-on capability. We have a sophisticated ability to manage roles and permissions for users, uh, as well as umbrella accounts. Umbrella accounts are the concept of a, a parent account with multiple child accounts. And if you look at the diagram on the right, you can see an example of the fact that in many, many organizations that we deal with, usage of cloud resources is a many-to-many -many mapping. You've got multiple users grouped into different teams, all of whom are accessing multiple resources. And that's what we've shown in this diagram where the master account has several teams. Each team has access uh, perhaps to overlapping groups of servers. So it's a fairly complex scenario, and you really need to manage who has access to see what resources, to take actions on what resources at a pretty granular level. So Michael, so this is what I can do then to avoid a situation where employees go off and create all cloud accounts, start deploying things, and there's no visibility and control. You can then use this to give them access to those resources, still maintaining that overall rubric of of the control and the auditability and the who's got access to what. That's exactly right. Um, so it enables sharing both inside the organization and externally if you want. And uh, it even en enables concepts like temporary sharing. So you can share an account with an expiration time. Finally, accountability is around the notion of being able to do cost tracking, for example. Uh, tell me how much I'm spending on which deployment uh, or which department over time. You can set quotas, so you're alerted to the fact. Uh, again, in a world of pay-as-you-go, normally there's, there's good savings involved, but we also see that when it's very easy to allocate resources, that consumption can also go up. And so you can set quotas and say, alert me when we've spent you know, a, certain, uh, a certain amount of money in a given month by a certain time period. In you know, for, for those of us that have worked with many projects and running in data centers, uh, recall that you just get one bill for your data center. Unless you have some very sophisticated equipment, which is rather expensive too, you just know your data center costs, whatever that amount is, 50000 that month. And it's just one flat number, as opposed to being able to segment and group things. How much is R&D costing? How much is this particular production environment or that skunk project? 
So there's some tremendous amount of accountability that you can get out of really being able to break down the different IT costs and assign them that way. Absolutely. It's been a very strong request from our customers, and one of the features they love the most is the real-time budgeting, the real-time run rate projections that we put up on our dashboard. It sounds very simple, but on most of the major public clouds out there, you don't know until the end of the month you get a single aggregate uh, amount, and you don't know what you're spending on what. So this is a very granular, real-time report. People love it. So the uh, one particular aspect of control that I wanted to call out that's part of our Enterprise Edition is what we call the infrastructure audit. And it's fairly straightforward and simple. Uh, I won't read through every bit of text here. This, this webinar is downloadable, and you can contact us to request the deck if you like. But it's basically around the notion that every, every so often you might run, want to run a security scan of your infrastructure to see, for example, which security groups um, are being utilized, how they're configured in terms of open ports, closed ports. Um, so it's a top-level audit that sends you information uh, that can also be downloaded uh, about basically the openness or, uh, or secure nature of the servers that you're running in the cloud. Uh, some of them, of course, you want to be entirely closed off just to verify that that's happening or alert you to situations that you might want to pay attention to. We've also made these audits downloadable in different forms for the purpose of keeping a record uh, of these security scan, uh, scans as a part of perhaps an ongoing regulatory compliance uh, effort on, on your organization's part. So that's one area that we've also found very popular. So that, that's an overview of the areas of control that are important in cloud management. Now let's turn to one that, that I think is increasingly important, portability. Yeah, Michael, let, let's talk about portability and let's look at some data. First, this is something that people were discussing from the, you know, from the early days, not that we're that far into it with cloud computing, but from the very beginning people recognized that that was going to make it rather interesting. And here's some data even uh, looking at that, how both large and small medium businesses break down in terms of what they expect their deployments are going to be between a public cloud, one that's managed, or a private and internal cloud, and what they were looking at. It's, it's skewed towards people still thinking that we're going to keep things in their internal data center, uh, but recognizing that they were going to want to run a particular uh, number of workloads externally or in a hybrid scenario. And notice this is data from 2010. We actually see this changing quite significantly as people recognize the value that can be gathered there. But portability, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it can be a, a, it's important to pay attention to designing things the right way to take advantage of portability. And, and it's this danger of lock-in. Designing an application that is so deeply woven into exactly the way a particular cloud provider works that moving it would essentially mean Redesign, not redesigning it, but rebuilding re it again. Uh, it, it's this idea that you might be locked in because of uh, long-term vendor contracts, but it's really about how do you design something that has the ability to then move between one provider and another by not using a specific API, for example, that will only work in a particular uh, environment that might not be what works for you to use from now, even though right now it seems like it's the right thing. So an approach is to pilot different things. Uh, if I were to have an environment running in Cloud A, how can I have a small uh, footprint somewhere else so that I can know what, so I can get my IT department used to what it's like to work with an environment like that. If I'm considering a private cloud, running a small test of what that looks like uh, internally or the portability designs. You know, I just had a comment here. Um, there's been a lot of education around cloud in the last few years, uh, cloud computing because it's new, particularly infrastructure as a service. But one area in our discussions with organizations, prospects, customers that doesn't require any education is the danger of lock-in. Because over the whole you know, history of IT, People have experienced that before. We don't need to name names and specifics, but we've all had the effect of lock-in 
how it uh, you know hinders our ability sometimes to innovate, how it becomes expensive. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it drives you nuts because you can't get things fixed or you, you just basically don't have freedom of choice to solve your problem the way you want. But it, easy to identify but difficult to solve, however, because it, it can be uh, almost pernicious in the way that you start deploying a little application that grows over time and next thing you know, now you're really stuck and you painted yourself into a corner when you were not meaning to do it originally. So we, we really see this as a multi-cloud world and not only that, we, we recognize even now that different infrastructure as a service providers are going to differentiate themselves by providing different features or capabilities. And, and let's take a look back of a few years ago when uh, people thought there was going to be one Linux version that would emerge as the winner that everybody standardized on. But reality, and reality is a lot messier than, than abstract concepts usually, showed us that that really wasn't what the world wanted. Some companies were focusing on security for the Linux distributions, that is, others for embedded systems, others for uh, vertical sales into enterprises, others for minimal environments that run very, very fast, and people stake different grounds. This is what we are seeing emerging in the cloud providers as well. And as an enterprise, you probably want to work at keeping a maximum flexibility because what you're looking for today and what you're planning on could be significantly different than what you want to do two years from now and you probably don't want to scrap all that work and start again. So this idea of using a cloud management system like RightScale is to have an abstraction layer between how your application works and how it connects and communicates and works with a different cloud. So you have, due to the abstraction layer, the ability to move between providers with the idea is that you want to keep your options open. Right, that's a cute photo. Um, we don't really know the story behind it, but I think with everybody on the webinar, if anyone has a good caption they'd like to suggest, <laughs> please send it in. We thought it was funny. Uh, okay, so you know we're nearing the end here, and we'll open up to QA in a minute. But uh, ultimately, this is is a diagram of cloud management as RightScale offers it, and how our platform fits in in the picture of the world. You can see there that uh, there are multiple benefits in that middle zone configuration management, which we mentioned was a key part of automation, uh, there's governance and control, there's the dashboard that, that provides the multi-cloud marketplace. <clears throat> the whole system you can see is enabling portability by uh, uh, giving you access to different cloud resource pools, whether they be different public cloud resources or different private cloud resources. You can see a particular program that we offer called MyCloud, which is in partnership with um, two different private cloud software companies, Eucalyptus and Cloud.com, now part of Citrix, uh, where we've worked with them to package up a very easy to install and get going private cloud that uh, spans right into registering itself with RightScale so that it exists alongside whatever public cloud you'd like to choose and enables what we call a hybrid cloud, simply the ability to use both public and private cloud resources. So that's the picture that, uh, that we see enabled around cloud management. Um, and, you know, we did a study <clears throat> with a, a third party called the FactPoint Group around what is the return on investment? Where are the savings here? And this was actually a comparison not of cloud and non-cloud, but of using a management platform like RightScale as against using simple APIs and consoles. And what we discovered through interviews with customers was pretty major gains around two areas. The first was initial deployment, so the initial um, migration to the cloud or the initial uh, conversion of an application or creation of an application or service in the cloud, and then ongoing gains of efficiency as maintenance and updates and new versions are, are pumped out with the application or service. So really major ROI that's usually delivered within a couple of months in our experience. Of course, it varies by, uh, by your mileage. It varies by your application and your situation. But uh, cloud is, is very quick to pay off. We do have on our website a TCO calculator, total cost of ownership. Um, you can get to it from, I believe, the cloud resources menu, or there's a URL right there. Um, and love to have you test that out. It's free. Um, it gives you some 
some feedback on different comparative scenarios depending on what kind of application you're running and your estimates for the size of uh, number of server instances, file storage, bandwidth, etc. And, and we'll give you some comparisons uh, to play with there. And you can also download uh, the results as a PDF. So ultimately, to wrap up here, um, we decided to use a quote of a uh, really advanced and brilliant cloud user, Adrian Cockroft from Netflix, uh, which is, of course, um, one of the, the, I think, most prominent examples of cloud usage also alongside Zynga. And he just said, look, we want to use clouds, not build them. And that's the philosophy, essentially, that we think is behind cloud management also. It's to allow you to get the benefit and, uh, and payoff of using clouds without having to get into the nitty-gritty of building and do-it-yourself from low-level APIs. So with that, I think we have a few minutes left. Would love to entertain any questions that you have. Um, and there's some links here if you would like some follow-up information. Um, you're welcome to contact us either by uh, email or by phone. And if you have anybody else who wasn't able to attend this live, there will be a recorded version up on our website later, along with a, a quite a substantial list of other resources about cloud. Um, and we have our next webinar in this series coming up on September 8th. So that said, let's open it up to Q&A. Give me a moment here. I need to look at uh, some of the questions that are coming in. Um, how difficult is it to customize these templates? For example, if I want a specific version of MS SQL instead of the latest and greatest, uh, it, it's actually hard to exaggerate how, how easy they are to customize. This wasn't a technical presentation, so we didn't go into a demo, but they are completely modular. When you look at a server template, and we actually have a webinar on just server templates, if you look in our library of webinars, uh, you see on, on, on a screen that shows all the scripts that will execute at boot time exactly what it's doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't have the exact configuration for the uh, Microsoft SQL Server setup memorized, but for many application servers, you literally have a drop-down menu in a script that will execute at boot time that will allow you to choose an application. I was working with some PHP stuff earlier this week, so we were looking at something where before you send up the server, you have a drop-down menu that will tell you you want uh, PHP 5.1 or 5.5. .5. And you choose that, and then you, you know, click launch, and you have the server set up that way, and you can have that particular value be inherited for all the machines that are part of a particular deployment so that it's distributed uh, throughout. So in short, it's very simple, and the specifics are actually not difficult to find out and learn how it works. And if you want to see more, just uh, contact us for the information you see on the screen, please. Right. Here's uh, actually a comment, not a question. It says, cool, my sister works at Eli Lilly. That's great. I hope she's using <laughs> self-service IT uh, based on RightScale. Uh, let us know if she is and how she likes it. Uh, next question was, what about managing DR, disaster recovery, and having control after decommissioning of cloud services or moving to a different cloud provider? So actually, disaster recovery is one of the major um, I'd say application solution areas that we get involved with with companies. It is relatively new uh, because as cloud computing at the infrastructure level has proliferated, there are many more options now. So we find reasons that, that companies go to different clouds. It might be, you know, the relationship they already have with a different provide, uh, with a uh, specific provider. It might be around pricing, geographical location. But sometimes it's uh, around disaster recovery. And the basic concept is that using the server template architecture that Yuri talked about, you can provision uh, either have a standby ready to go or a small warm footprint running in a different resource pool. Again, we think of resource pools. That might be a different public cloud. It might be a private cloud, et cetera, depending on your needs. So it's quite easy and fast to fire up or decommission resources uh, among those clouds. Now, that assumes that the solution has been designed for DR. So there, there really isn't a magic wand that you can wave where um, with no foreplanning, you, you know, automatically have a DR solution somewhere else. You need to think about strategies like uh, data replication, if there's data involved. 
uh, so that the, the, the DR spare has the up-to-date data. You need to think about failover and, and uh, switch over scenarios and things like that. But once you've done that, you can get a super cost-effective and quite efficient solution that will respond very quickly. So I have a question here. Can I interface your audit entries against an enterprise change reconciliation system? Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to skip the rest of the details of the question here. Uh, short answer is uh, yes. Actually, if you look at the slide, one of the bullet points we had on the slide about the infrastructure audit is that you can, uh, be you can download the information as text or as a JSON file. So you can get the data in a structured format that then you can look at importing it into a different control system so that you can make it part of a broader uh, uh, set of policies and procedures you have for this control management and audit. That was part of the thinking behind this feature. It's just companies that have some, some strict rules they must follow and they have some automated ways in which they comply with those and that we can uh, run that way. Let me go to the next question here. Uh, are user apps installed to a server instance via the dashboard as well? Uh, or is there a way to log in using, say, SSH? Uh, let me say, and again, we didn't do a demo on this presentation because it wasn't meant to be technical. Uh, anything that you can do on the server directly, uh, you are not stopped by doing it because you're using write scale. There's nothing that you can now no longer do on the server because you're using write scale. You've got complete control of all your machines at all times, either root access or admin access, depending on your operating system. So yeah, we actually made it super simple. You can be looking at the UI and click on a button and log in with SSH. But if it's something you want to install on a server template you're creating, you can actually simply write a script that pulls a package from either your own repository or you store the file in a, in a place that's accessible via the web, and you can automate that. So there's all sorts of uh, interesting flexibility and capabilities there. Thanks, Yuri. Um, next question, what developer skills are required to use the APIs? So talk a little bit about the context there. There are different levels of APIs. So when we were talking about clouds having APIs and, and dealing with sort of the low level, uh, very detailed, tedious interface level, I was talking about interface APIs to low level infrastructure as a service clouds. And those APIs are, I guess I would say, plentiful and quite detailed and quite technical. So operating at the API level with the low level infrastructure cloud gives you a lot of control but you often will be you know, building your own do-it-yourself solution and responsible for doing that. Uh, and as with many things in IT, you know, do you want to be spending your time on that? With regard to APIs in RightScale or interfaces in RightScale, <clears throat> there's quite a selection. So RightScale itself has its own API. What's the benefit of that? Well, you're dealing with this uh, intermediate layer where you can create assets like server templates, et cetera, and launch those, where there's a lot more automatic behavior. It also gives you the portability abstraction layer. Uh, so if you still are at the programming level where you'd like to interface with an API, or perhaps someone in your organization needs to get some information out of the right scale system or have some control over it at an API level, that's fine. But you can also deal with right scale at the dashboard level which is a much easier user interface. And at the dashboard level, actually it's quite simple even for a business user to launch a server uh, which either requests a couple of parameters or none. Um, so those of us who are not programmers around here, like Yuri and I, frequently launch servers, simple blogs and things like that, or even multi-user, uh, multi-system clusters with a push of a button. And then finally, there's the highest level interface that doesn't even require interfacing with the dashboard. Uh, and that was the Eli Lilly example, where it's just a single button push to launch an application that's been created by an IT department uh, so that the application is predictable, it's reliable, and IT has governance control over what's running, but the business user can just point and click. And, and I'd like to mention also, Michael, that we recently released the version 1.5 of the API, and we've been uh, iterating and adding lots of interesting features and capabilities there. Very good. Let's see. Any other questions? You know, I, I, I have a question that we can tackle quickly. It's not really on point for this. Somebody's asking, uh, from a business user point of view, can you run an instance of Microsoft Office in a cloud instance without using Microsoft 365? I mean, I, I can think from a technical perspective a couple of ways you might want to do that, but that's, this is really a software licensing 
uh, question. I don't know the exact rules for uh, Microsoft and, and how that's capable. So sometimes technology tells you one thing, but the software licenses work in a, a different way. And not being a Microsoft expert, I'm not sure I can uh, direct you to something that would comply with uh, both of those requirements. OK, here's a question. Can I sign in to RightScale and get a cloud started right away, or do I need to have an existing cloud service account such as EC2? You, uh, you do need to have an existing cloud service account, uh, or you can get the MyCloud software and create your own cloud on your own hardware internally, either way. Uh, you can today sign up for Amazon or Rackspace, um, get the account ID. Uh, I think I'm certain that Amazon has a free micro yeah. micro size server. T1 micro a instance. A T1 yes. micro instance, and you can register with the free edition of RightScale and start playing with that. Um, I'm not sure what other free offerings are available in, outside of MyCloud, but that is the that is exactly the right concept. We talk to cloud resource pools through the API layer, and that's registered with us through a cloud service account. Cool. Well, thank you so much for attending. I think uh, it's lunchtime on the Pacific Coast, and for the rest of you, we're on the hour. So we're going to thank you so much for joining us today. This webinar has been recorded. It will be posted on our site within the next few hours, and we'll also be sending an email out to all attendees tomorrow morning with the link to that. Um, thanks again for attending. I'd just like to also remind you that our next, the, sec the second part in the webinar series is next, is next Thursday, September 8th, Five Quick Wins for the Cloud. Just want to point out that we'll be joined there by Brian Adler, our professional services architect. Brian is uh, super, super smart and works with customers every single day on their cloud deployments and helps them get live in the cloud. So it's, it'll be quite a treat to have Brian on a webinar with us, so you won't want to miss that. We'll also have Rafael Saavedra with us. He's our VP of Engineering. Rafael is also super smart, so it's pretty much going to be a really great webinar. If you're not already registered for that, I know a lot of you are, um, just go to that URL that you see below and sign on up. Thanks again for joining, and have a great day. Bye.